part two of our Who is the Prophet Most Like Moses series, Jesus vs. Muhammad. And this one, we're going to be doing part two. We left off with our first five parallels, leaving off with the Tabat Gome, or the Ark of Bulrushes, which is a parallel between Moses and the Ark of the Bulrushes in the Nile, and Jesus and his blessed mother, the Theotokos and her womb, for the Tabat Gome. And so we did a really cool parallel there on part one. You can check that all out. But here in part two, we're going to continue on with more parallels between Moses and Jesus, making it undeniable that he is the prophet described in Deuteronomy. Now, before we do anything, I am a catechumen in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So I want to make a prayer for the catechumens and do a prayer before we do any theology because prayer always comes before theology. And then I'll also minimize this camera, put it in the corner and have the slides pop up so you guys can see. So, But let's do a prayer real quick for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord our God, have mercy on your servants, the catechumens. Instruct them in the word of truth. Reveal to them the gospel of righteousness and in due time unite them to your holy catholic and apostolic church numbering them with your chosen flock amen amen all right so that was our prayer that we wanted to do for all of us catechumens this is the anthologian by the way from saint ignatius orthodox press absolutely fantastic prayer book it's kind of like the Roman Catholic breviary, but for Eastern Orthodox, so I highly recommend. Now, we left off with the Tabat Gome, and now we're going to go on to our sixth parallel, and that is that both of them had Miriam's watching from a distance. Now, in Exodus 2.4, his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. Now, the context of this is obviously of Moses' sister, Miriam. So, we know that Moses had a sister, and... John 19, 17, Therefore the soldiers did all these things by standing by the cross of Yeshua where his mother Miriam and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. So there was three Marys, not just one Mary. So yes, you can put a check mark on that one that both of them had Miriam's or Mary staring at a distance. So Moses and Jesus both had Miriam's standing at a distance. There's a parallel, our sixth parallel. Now, in Exodus 2.4, for our seventh parallel, in Exodus 2.4, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens, walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket, the Tabat, among the reeds, and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened, she saw a child, this is a yeled, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. And so we see that in this part of Exodus 2.4 that Moses is described as a Hebrew. We know he's of Hebrew lineage. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, or Gabriel, was sent from Elohim, from God, to a city in the Galil. This is the Galilee, you know. This is the Galil. You probably heard of the gun, poop, pew, pew, you know. But it's actually the actual way to pronounce the Galilee, the Galilee word. So they went to the Galil called Netzeret, to a town called Netzeret, Nazareth, 
to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Miriam. So, as we can see here from the Torah regarding both Moses and Jesus, they were both of Hebrew lineage. You can't really get more Hebrew than being of uh, a descendant of David. I, there, that is pretty pretty Hebrew right there. So, they're both Hebrews. You can put a check mark on that one as well for our seventh parallel. Now, now on to our eighth parallel in Exodus two ten. The child, Yeled, grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. We're talking about Moses here. And she named him Moshe, because I drew him out of the water. So as we can read from the passage, that Moshe is adopted. So not only did we just read that Moses was adopted, but also in Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, we can glean as well that Yeshua was adopted too. We can read as follows. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the Yela, the child who has been conceived in her, is of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Now, what do we see here? We see that both are being adopted. Joseph's not really the father, right? Because the Holy Spirit, actually the Word incarnate Logos, dwelled inside Mary's womb. And so Mary actually has the incarnate Logos inside of her, who is Jesus's true father. Well, obviously, he is before even Joseph. So he's being adopted, right? Because he's really, his true father is God himself. And he is the first son, the true son, where Israel failed, where Adam failed, and where Isaac wasn't going to be offered up. There's so many parallels you see in literature in the Old Testament that allude to Christ. And of course, Christ is that true sacrifice. He is the true son of God. Now, on to our ninth parallel, because I don't want to get carried away. That's a whole theological bet. <laughs> on to our ninth parallel. Uh, we can put a check mark on that eighth parallel, though, that both are adopted. So, on to our ninth parallel with Moses. Moses' parents in Exodus 6.20, Amram married his father's sister, Jochebed, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the length of Amram's life was 137 years. Now, this is kind of cool. If you guys know the most common ages, the most common lifespan in the Bible is 137 years of age. That is Ishmael, that is Amram, and that is Levi, who all live to 137 years of age. It's the most common age for you to die in the Bible. So that's kind of cool. Now, the mother is Jochebed, and her name consists of Yud, Kaf, Bet, and Dalet. So four letters, and her name means glory of God, or glory of God, or glory to God. Now, this glory of God, this Yochebed, is going to marry Amram, and Amram consists of Ain, Mem, Resh, and Mem. And Amram's name means exalted nation. So when you take the glory of God and marry it to an exalted nation, you take Jochebed and you marry it to Amram, or Amram to Jochebed, you can do that as well. Uh, what do you get? You get the glory of God marrying an exalted nation, and you will bring forth Moshe, the deliverer, which is what Moshe's name means. And so Musa, in Arabic, of course, Moses in English, Moshe in Hebrew. Now, the same theme and concept is preached on the rooftops, that the glory of God is going to marry an exalted nation of Israel, and, of course, the church being the bride of Christ. In Isaiah 54, 5, prophesied, For your husband is your maker, whose name is yud heh this is Hashem, 
the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called God of all the earth. Boom. Like, <laughs> boom. He's called God of all the earth. Boom. Now this passage by the prophet Isaiah is telling Israel that their husband is their maker, right? El Shaddai, Hashem, Yudhei Vavhe, is their maker. And not only is uh, God our maker, but he's also our husband, and as well, he's our redeemer. So this states plainly that the redeemer, the Mashiach, the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua HaNotsri, Vamelech HaYehudim, is the God of all the earth, and our relationship with him is being as the bride of Christ, who is our maker, our husband, our redeemer. This is so huge, prophetically tying in for the church, for Israel being the church and the church. It's just whew, huge. So put a check, check mark on that one. Uh, there's our there's our ninth parallel. So that's a pretty good one. That's a pretty good one. All right, now the next parallel onto our 10th parallel, I think, we're on, yeah, parallel number 10 now, is that both were rejected by their own initially. So now it came to pass in Exodus 2, chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, now it came to pass in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he, Moses, looked this way and that, and when he saw that there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And in Exodus 2, 13 to 14, it leads us on further. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But the other Hebrew said, Who made you a prince or judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? That's a pretty good comeback one-liner, i got to admit. So he got thoroughly rebuked, and he was rejected. So as we can see in this passage, that at one point Moses was rejected by his own Hebrew brothers. In fact, in the Brit Hadashah, in the Gospel book of Yochanan, in chapter 19, verses 13 to 15, it reads, Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Yeshua, Jesus, Yusos, Christos, out and sat down on the pavement, the judgment seat, at a place called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabatha, or Gabatha, however you really pronounce it. Now, it was, day, it was the day of preparation for the Pesach, and it was about the sixth hour, and he, Pontius Pilatos, said to the Yehudim, Behold, your Malek, your king, right? So the Yehudim cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilatos said to them, Shall I crucify your Malek, the king? Right? So the chief priests answered, the chief Kohen answered, we have no king but Caesar. Ah, oh, what hypocrites, what hypocrites. This is not a good thing, right? Their king, they're, they're supposedly these high chief priests, and then when it comes push to shove, they have no king but Caesar, right? But they're, they don't realize their king is right there and the Mashiach's right there. <laughs> they're very huge prophetically. All right, now I think we're on parallel number 11. We're going to go on now to our next parallel, which is that both gave up a prominent position within their power. They actually gave up a lot of power. It gave up a, a prominent position that they had. Now, if we look at Moses killing an Egyptian, you know, Pharaoh tried to kill Moses. But as we know, Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So Moses, being adopted into Pharaoh's own household, held a very prominent position that Moses gave up. Now in the New Testament, there are an abundance of verses of the Logos. I mean, this is the pre-incarnate Logos. Jesus, the Word, giving us his preeminent, giving up his preeminent, prominent position in heaven by coming down to man and humbled himself. And this expresses well in Philippians 2, 5, 7. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? Jesus Christos, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, a slave, and being made in the likeness of men. So as we can see, both Moses and Jesus he gave a, a very prominent position, and oh, how so much greater did Jesus give up and suffered for all of creation and the victory he had on the cross. Now, on to I think our 12th parallel is Exodus 2, 15 to 16, where we find that Moses meets a foreign woman at a well. So, in Exodus 2, 15 to 16, we can read, when the Pharaoh, or when Pharaoh, heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So as we can see, Moses meets a woman at a foreign well. And in John... 4, chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, And Yeshua had to pass through Samaria, Shomron. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sukkar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. So as we can see here, a woman draws up to the well here where Jesus is at, and Jesus asks her, Give me a drink. So Jesus meets a woman at a foreign well, this Samarian well. Moses, being in Midian, meeting Jethro's daughters, and then Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well, both foreign wells, they're meeting foreign women at a foreign wells, that's another parallel for Moses and Jesus as well. Put a check mark on that one for parallel number 12. Wait, wait, we have a bonus. Who was the woman at the foreign well? Well, in Eastern Orthodox tradition, she is actually a saint, Saint Photini or Saint Photini. I can't actually pronounce it right. If you're a Greek, Put it in the comments how you pronounce it correctly. But it's Saint Photini, and Saint Photini was that Samaritan woman at the well. This Shomroni woman, this Samaritan woman, becomes an early evangelist testifying to the advent of Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One of Israel, and, of course, our husband, our maker, our redeemer, God of all the earth, Isaiah 54, and bringing others to him. According to an early tradition in the Orthodox Church, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos, she was baptized with the name Photini, which means the enlightened one. Photini, the Shomroni woman, followed suit by having her two sons and five daughters and she spread the Holy Gospel to those in Carthage in North Africa. However, the Roman Emperor Nero, in his famous per persecution, or infamous persecution of the church, put to death Photini and her family. The martyrdom of St. Photini and her family is remembered in the church on March 20th and on the fourth Sunday of Pascha. And if you want to learn all about St. Photini from the book of John, chapter 4, verses to 42, you can read the entire passage and read it on the fifth Sunday of Pascha as well, called the Sunday of the Samaritan Woman. So, yeah, there's a little extra bonus. Who was the Samaritan woman at the well? It was Saint Photini, and she was martyred along with, I believe, her entire family in Carthage under Nero's persecution. So, Again, the Bible is living, it's breathing. The saints are with us. It's not just some time period way off in the past. The church is something that God, that Christ, gave us. And so it's just, whew, thank you. All right, so thank you, Lord. <laughs> All right, so yeah, that's really it, guys. That's our extra bonus. We are, again, 12 parallels. We just went over six seven more. <laughs> we just went over seven more parallels in this video, and so we'll hope to see you guys in part three with parallel number 13. So, Christos Anesti, we'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. God bless. See you soon.